Okay, so we're going live on Facebook. We have attendees joining us. So I believe we're we're live, eh? Well, welcome everyone on Zoom and coming in on Facebook. My name is Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture agent in Leon County. And you are here at the Garden in the Panhandle live beneficial insects session. So we've been doing this uh, fellow horticulture agent, specialist, faculty from UF have been putting on these virtual sessions for the last couple months. So I hope you're excited and I hope you're in the right place. Many of you have sent us questions. So thank you very much. Uh, while we're waiting to get fully started, those of you on Zoom, feel free to type in the chat box, get ready, get used to the chat box and tell us where you're coming from. Uh, also remind folks that are visiting or that are joining us via Zoom uh, that we will be posting references to the answers uh, to the questions here and we will be putting them in the chat. Hey, Ann Selland. That's a familiar name. I know Ann Selland. Beth, I know you think, I think you know Ann Selland too. Yeah. All right. Gulf Breeze, Tallahassee, Escambia, Walton County, some other, some more Okaloosa folks. So this is great. We're getting a good little stretch of the panhandle right here on Garden in the Panhandle Live. Perfect. Pace. I'm out of state too, I see. Do we have an out of stater? Oh, yeah, Gulf. I think so. Gulf I see a name leader out of state. Mm -hmm. Wow, Bellevue, PNS. Wait a second. What's PNS? Help me out here. Pensacola, more Pensacola. Ah, sorry. All right, well, it's one o'clock. Uh, again, welcome everyone. My name is Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture agent in Leon County, Florida. And this is Gardening in the Panhandle Live. Today we're talking about beneficial insects. We have a great group of panelists here to help answer your questions. Many of the questions we've gotten here uh, through your registration. So we're gonna go through and answer those. Folks on Facebook that are watching, you can post questions in the chat. We will try to answer those. Uh, folks in Zoom, you can also go to the Q&A and ask some additional questions. Uh, let's see, we'll get started here. I'm gonna first ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So how about we start with the, the, from the mothership, coming to us live from the mothership in Gainesville is Dr. Adam Dale. So uh, Dr. Dale, tell us about yourself, what you do. Hi everyone, my name is Adam Dale. I am an assistant professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, and I study insects in urban landscapes. So anything that's gonna be in a lawn or on a tree or shrub that falls on my plate. Sometimes though he showed us a well. Never mind. We'll ex we'll ignore what you found in your office. Okay. Then going over to Pensacola, let's go with Beth. Hello, glad to be here. I'm Beth Bowles from Escambia County, and uh, love insects. Love studying them. Haven't been in school for insects in a while, but uh, always enjoy finding new things in the garden. Great, and we'll go east to Julie. Hi, I'm Julie McConnell. I'm the horticulture agent in Bay County. Uh, our office is in Panama City, and um, I've got horticulture and entomology background also. And then at the very east of the district, Danielle Sprague. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Hey, everybody. My name is Danielle Sprague, and I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Jefferson County. Um, our office is located in Monticello, um, and my background is in entomology as well. And she loves citrus, as you can tell there. Yes. Um, before we get, so our topic today is beneficial insects, specifically predators. And I wanted to have Dr. Dale just kind of give us a brief introduction to, you know, the role beneficial insects play maybe for gardeners, but even for non-gardeners like Mr. John Wells, our IT guy. Oh, that reminds me, we got a lot of folks in the background helping out. So we have John Wells. Uh, he's our district IT person kind of helping us out. Mary Derrick from Santa Rosa County, I believe she's on Zoom. And we have Ashley Cush, who's a new horticulture agent in Jackson County. Uh, so welcome Ashley to the Garden in the Panhandle Live group. She's helping on Facebook. So thank you to them. Uh, but uh, Dr. Dale, if you could explain, you know, how beneficial insects and, you know, predators are helpful, how they play a role in the environment, how they're helpful to folks that garden, maybe that don't garden, and also maybe bring up parasitoids because 
you know, there's other things that maybe aren't praying necessarily, but they're still helping us control some and they're beneficial, right? So if you could uh, go over that for us real quick, that'd be great, Dr. Dale, a little intro. Absolutely. So beneficial insects, they include a lot of stuff. Typically when we think about insects or when the general public thinks about insects, they think about pests and that's because they either annoy us or they eat our plants or they cause other problems. But in reality, 99% of the insects that are out there in our landscapes are beneficial doing one good thing or the other. Uh, when it comes to insects that eat pests or other insects, that's what we're thinking about when we talk about beneficial insects today and predators. There are generally three P's of beneficial insects. You got predators, or not of insects, but predators, parasites, and pathogens. Uh, pathogens are gonna be things like fungi and bacteria that attack insects and kill them naturally. Uh, parasites include things like nematodes that swim into insect bodies and release bacteria and then basically cause them to erupt in worms. And then you have other parasites like parasitoids, which include flies and wasps. Um, and these things are like the movie Alien, where they come in and sting. So imagine a big wasp comes over to me, stings me in the stomach, and lays an egg in my chest. That thing hatches and then slowly eats me from the inside out and then emerges from my stomach as another wasp. And that happens all the time around where we live. So if you go outside, you're definitely surrounded by these little tiny parasitoids that are helping regulate pests. Um, and so in general, what beneficials do, what predators and parasites do is they help keep pest populations and um, populations of other insects below damaging levels um, and regulate their populations. So they keep some insects from completely consuming plants um, and help maintain this balance in nature. And in urban landscapes, like around our house or in the cities, uh, you see a lot of pest outbreaks, but if you go into like a, for example, scale insects are really common in the landscape. If you go into a forest, you probably won't see a scale insect outbreak. And one reason for that is there's a lot more predators in the forest than there are in urban areas. And so they're able to escape and then cause a lot more damage. So if we can have more predators doing more work, that's gonna do us a lot of good. All right, thank you, sir. Well, let's get right into it. And I think this was a question that many folks asked. So again, we took questions from uh, the participants and I think on a lot of folks' mind is, and I'm going to ask you, Julie, to answer this first one here, is how in the world do we know there's a lot of insects out there? How do we know which insects are beneficial and which ones are pests on our plants or around our home? Well, one thing is we, we try to encourage people to get familiar with common uh, predatory insects or parasitoids that you might find in the landscape, which can take a little research and not everybody is really that interested in bugs and, and we get that. Um, but a really simple thing is just watch them, see what they're doing, observe. You know, obviously if an insect is eating your plant, then it's at least an herbivore, maybe an omnivore. And so that might be a pest. Of course, it may not be really of any consequence. A lot of times they, you know, the plants can handle the damage. Um, whereas your predators are ten going to more likely be either you can sometimes see them eating the insect, you know, observe that yourself, but just their activity. They might be lying in wait to ambush or they might be actually chasing prey or making traps. And so you really just have to kind of slow down and take the time to watch and see what they're doing and, you know, just check the activity level. Is it actually causing damage to the plant or is it possibly feeding on the ones that are? That's really going to be your most basic guide. And then maybe will you see that whole process that Dr. Dale talked about, the, you know, the alien movie thing? Um, you can with some. Now, a lot of the a lot of those parasitoids are very, very small. But um, in, in the case of the Lara wasp that targets the mole crickets, you know, I've actually seen them um, sting 
a mole cricket and lay an egg and then fly off and the mole cricket kind of shakes itself back and crawls down into the ground completely, um, you know, mortified, but uh, <laughs> the act has occurred. So, so you can sometimes see that happen. Um, a lot of times you'll just see evidence of it though. And, and I do want to give a plug here. There's a, there's a very handy book, a little booklet. You see how nice this size here. It's very handy. It's called Helpful, Harmful, Harmless Insects and Other Organisms of Florida Landscapes. And it breaks it down into, you know, which ones are beneficial, which ones are a pest, and which ones are just out there doing nothing. It's written by someone we know, Dr. Dale. Uh, so good job, Dr. Dale. It's very helpful. We have several Master Gardener volunteers that say it's one of their grandchildren's favorite flip books. So good job. I don't know if you meant that for your audience, but it's it worked. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, my nieces and nephews love it too. Awesome. Okay, Beth, I'm going to ask you a question. And these are two um, pests. They're, they're two insects that we may see in the garden. And this is a kind of a, a common uh, question to us or folks want to know. You know, we have sometimes uh, stink bugs that can be helpful, but we also have some stink bugs that can be harmful. So how would we know when we're, when we say we know we have, at least we know we have a stink bug, how do we know if it's a good one or a bad one to have around? Yeah, stink bugs can be pretty bad pests in the garden. And there's quite a few of them out there that can damage fruit and, and really kind of wreck our day when we go to pick our tomato or, or melon. Uh, but there are predators out there that are also in that same group. And so we don't want to do something if we have predators present, maybe getting a caterpillar or taking care of some of those pest problems. It used to be that we kind of generally said for a stink bug, if it had spines on the soldiers, we considered on the shoulders, I'm sorry, uh, we considered that a beneficial, uh, but that doesn't hold true. So again, like Julie said, you really have to be observant, but if you wanna get kind of down and you don't mind catching in a jar and really looking closely, uh, the predator is going to have a really stout needle mouth part. It's going to be shorter, whereas the plant feeder is going to have a really long, narrow mouth part that's going to be very long for puncturing and going into leaf tissue and fruit tissue. So that's kind of some ways to tell. Uh, so the, the spines on the shoulders don't always hold true, but if you can look on the underside, you can see that. Sometimes with a lot of beneficials, they don't necessarily like to be in groups either. You know, they're hunters, so they need to be alone because that's what they're ambushing, some prey, whereas your plant feeders may be a little more gregarious and you may find larger numbers of them together. Uh, so that really holds true with like our scented plant bug versus our assassin bug that you may learn about later. But we have a great guide to stink bugs. This is also produced by U University of Florida IPM. So, you know, if you do a lot of vegetable gardening, this is going to show you some of those beneficials with excellent photos that you can see something in the garden, flip through it or snap a photo and send it to us as well. And we'll help you make sure you don't make a decision for a predator when, uh, you, you know, you don't need to, to manage that. Very good. So the, you know, I was used to think of those little spines on the shoulders like the brawl like the thing madonna wore right didn't madonna back in the day wear this thing with the spiky shoulder pads oh yeah but, the so that's not always true the that's not always true um, <laughs> so, um the book so someone asked the question on zoom here like where do you find these books and they are available through the uf ifas extension bookstore and i believe they did put the link in there for the helpful harmful harmless book but I believe the stink bug flip chart is available through the bookstore as well, right, Beth? I believe so, yeah, okay. Um, okay, Danielle, we're, I'm gonna go to you. We're still a little bit on the stink bugs here and we had several folks ask and we'll get down to um, you know, some specific species a little bit later and we'll talk more about the leaf footed bugs, but they, you know, folks wanna know and you know, trying to tell apart what do they have here, the Stink bugs versus leaf-footed bugs, are they both harmful? Is one of them helpful? Beth kind of maybe gave us a little preview there, but what do you got to say about leaf-footed bugs versus stink bugs, Danielle? Yeah, so um, the key identification or identifying factor between a leaf-footed bug and a stink bug, they are, of course, related. 
Um, but with the leaf footed bugs, they have a flattened leaf like um, hind tibia essentially. Um, and so that is their distinguishing factor. So they're going to be probably like three fourths of an inch compared to a stink bug that's um, a little bit smaller. So um, maybe a half inch. And then the um, the the stink bugs, they have like a shield type body almost compared to the leaf footed bug that's got a longer, but again, that um, hind leg that is flattened so that they can blend in to look like a leaf. Um, and with that, again, I always love the helpful, harmful, harmless book. That is one of my favorites. Um, so, um, and then Beth did allude to some of them being predatory. And so again, their um, beak, if you can tell by their, <laughs> their beak, um, I guess um, their proboscis, I guess that would be the, the correct entomology term maybe, um, but they're gonna have a stouter one than a, a plant feeder that's gonna have that long, more skinny, skinny one. I'm a botanist, so beak works great for me, Danielle. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's something more people can kind of like think of it as, I guess. All right. Well, thank you, Danielle. And some folks did ask, and uh, maybe we can find the map of the local extension office, right? Because someone asked, you know, is there a local source for, well, maybe they're looking for beneficial insects specifically, but beneficial insects in IPM, which is integrated pest management, there is your local extension office. And like Beth said, you know, feel free to send us pictures to your local agent on what you're seeing, you know, is this good? Is it bad? Should I do I need to do anything? Um, so just know you have your local county extension agents to help you out. Okay, um, let's see, I'm gonna move down the, you know, we had a lot of questions on how can we support beneficial insects or maybe even augment add to. And so I want to go to Dr. Dale and ask, you know, what are, you know, can you give us three, four, five kind of things that folks can do to encourage the beneficial insects in their yard? And maybe at the same time, while not encouraging, you know, the pest insects. So you got a couple like bullet points for them, Dr. Dale, that they can do to, to help support these in their landscape. I don't know about bullet points, but I'll try to make them bullet points. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do to encourage the beneficials and help discourage the things that are trying to eat your plants. Uh, I would say some of the things that you have the most control over are the plants you have in your yard or in your landscape. Um, more flowering plants is going to attract more beneficial things. So you plant, you generally plant flowers to attract pollinators like bees. Uh, but a lot of pollinators also eat insects or they feed their babies insects. So um, having flowering plants and a bunch of different types of flowering plants in your yard definitely increases the population of predatory or parasitic insects. Um, so that's one good way. Uh, having a bunch of different plants. So rather than having, for example, just a hedge of viburnum, maybe you have a hedge of viburnum with four or five other plant species in front of it. Um, the more plant species you have, the more things they are going to support. And therefore, you've got a, a greater diversity of things that are flying around, crawling around, helping eat pests. Um, the other thing you can do is, is specifically related to pest management. So rather than going and grabbing the seven dust or the malathion out of your garage when you find some aphids on your citrus tree, uh, I would try to mix it up a little and use some things that are either more selective for those aphids or they have uh, less broad spectrum toxicity to the beneficial things. So. For example, at my house, if I get aphids or other pests on my lemon tree, I will grab some insecticidal soap that's mixed with pyrethrins and I'll spray that on those. That breaks down really quickly. So the next day when parasitoid wasps or ladybugs are crawling over that plant material, they're not going to die. 
but if you put something like malathion or seven dust or something on that plant material, predatory insects that are crawling over those leaves, well after you have made that application, are going to die. And then you're going to have fewer predators crawling around helping control pests. So I don't think those were bullets, but maybe. maybe yeah, we'll, work on, we'll work on that, Dr. Dale. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Julie, um, this is something, you know, folks may be wondering, well, you know, you can buy ladybugs. You might be able to buy predatory stink bugs online somewhere, or, you know, maybe at a local garden center. How, how helpful is that? So, you know, is it helpful to order these insects, you know, such as ladybugs, maybe, I mean, praying mantids even, I guess you could order. So are these helpful? And like, if you do purchase these, are they going to stick around and, you know, reproduce on your, in your landscape or is it just random and they're going to be gone the next day? So tell us about this whole buying beneficial insects and releasing them in your landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that there's a whole lot of data that supports that it's it's cost effective to do it in the landscape setting in greenhouses or in field crops. I know that that's where the focus has been on the research. And so, um, you know, there are some recommendations and protocols in those types of situations where there, ha there has been some success. Um, I'm thrifty. And so for me to the thought of buying insects that may or may not establish themselves where I release them is not really top of my list. Um, I've really found that if you have a diverse landscape and you are cautious about um, pesticide use, they're going to show up. Um, you know, and, and the thing with, if you purchase predators, you have to already have something there for them to eat, but it shouldn't already be at such a level that it's a desperate situation because then they won't get it in check. So that would not be worth your while. Um, you know, if you are applying pesticides and doing some other things, that's going to impact them. And your predators are going to have needs other than just feeding on, you know, the pest insect, which is what your hope is, because a lot of them are generalist and they might decide to eat something else. But they also need water, shelter, you know, they need that pollen and nectar available to, you know, fuel flight and other things too. So, you know, if you don't already have that environment set up that's going to attract them naturally, they're probably not going to stay if you release them. So you can do it, but you probably don't need to. Okay, well, thank you. And they probably may not, you know, you can do it, but you better watch them real quickly in your landscape because they may not stick around for very long, huh? Yeah, if they don't have their basic needs for life, they are not going to stay um, or they'll eat each other, you know? So it, it's just, you know, it, it may be something fun to do and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but um, it, it probably is not going to have a significant impact, especially quickly that you, you might expect unless it, unless it's a controlled environment. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julie. That's, uh, I hope that's helpful to a lot of folks listening in. Um, Beth, going to you, uh, let's say that we want to protect beneficial insects, uh, but we have a garden that has, you know, these, these harmful pests that we're trying to control, you know, and maybe Dr. Dale kind of went with this, you know, talked about this a little bit, but how do we, how do we balance, you know, uh oh, we have an infestation of, you know, leaf-footed bugs, how do we try to control them without, you know, damaging the, some of the predators that are maybe already be around? Yeah, we, we definitely practice IPM and using some of those techniques. We don't necessarily reach for the chemical. If there's another alternative to take care of some of those pests, uh, the common one is if someone sees a few caterpillars or bagworms on a plant, you know, removing them. Uh, I'm kind of a strange person because one of my favorite activities as a kid was pulling off all the bad worms on our spruce tree. Uh, so I was the control right there. Uh, it, you know, you're, if you need to use a chemical, like Dr. Dale said, you choose something that is least toxic, that's going to be less uh, impactful for those predators and parasitoids that are going to come later. You direct that and target that spray to where you need to be instead of just a blanket over everything uh, because you know your choices can have consequences down the road 
uh, far, far beyond just killing that pest right there. So, you know, look at other control methods. I'm very tolerant. A few weeks ago, I saw some gara that was covered in aphids. And when I look closer, there were so many predators on that plant. I just decided just leave it alone. And, you know, the gara looked fine. It wasn't too bad, uh, even though it had aphids on it. So just sometimes leaving things alone or just picking them off will do. And then just targeting something that's going to be maybe more specific to that insect, not just kill everything. And I guess one thing, uh, when I mentioned leaf-footed bugs, also sometimes the, the you know, if you notice a pest, uh, it's a good idea to contact your local extension office because sometimes the particular life cycle that pest is in is very is not controllable, basically, right? It's not very effective to use products. So, you know, sometimes you got to get them in that larval or nymph stage, right, rather before they become adults. And so even if you use products, they may not be helpful and you're causing these other, you know, problems. So Mark, a, yeah, great point, Mark, because one of our common mistakes, whether it's weeds or insects, we usually see things when they're mature. And that's not really the best time to be using some type of chemical because they're just not going to be as effective. Uh, so you're right when it's young, but that's why we get out and enjoy our landscape and look around and, and see what's there. Yeah, we've talked a lot about observing and I love that. We got to get people outside looking at their plants more. Uh, Dr. Dale, I'm going to come back to you and it kind of follows what Julie was talking about, but this is particular to greenhouse situation. So if you have a greenhouse, in this case, is it effective to buy some predatory insects to introduce to that greenhouse? Yeah, so, uh, so this is what we call augmentative uh, biological control, where you're, you're pumping natural enemies, predators, parasites into the system, and that is a lot more effective in greenhouses. Uh, and the primary reason for that is because they are enclosed in that greenhouse and they can't escape. So um, that doesn't mean they're going to persist in the absence of food. So you still got to have uh, some food sources in there for them to feed on. But it is a lot more effective to release uh, parasitoid wasps, predatory beetles, all sorts of different things um, that you can buy in greenhouses. And one of the reasons you have to do that in a greenhouse, right, is because the natural ones that in your landscape just show up can't get in either, right? Just like the ones you introduce can't get out. All the good That's right, yeah. Greenhouses are really good for uh, triggering pest outbreaks because <laughs> they are easy to sneak in on the plants and then there's nothing in there to eat them. So a lot of times you have to augment the predators because they can't get in otherwise. Uh, Beth, uh, thank you, Dr. Dale. Beth, going back to you and Danielle, I promise we'll get back to you. Uh, I got a question later on coming for you, Danielle. Um, but Beth, the, are there any predator insects, any beneficial insects that we know as predators or maybe parasitoids that are harmful to bees? And they didn't specify honeybees versus some of our native bees, but any of these, you know, good bugs, bad to the bees? Well, I mean, we kind of have to look at the word harmful. It's, you know, there a lot of these predators are just going to take advantage of what is available. Um, you know, if a dragon, a dragonfly, robber fly is moving around and a honeybee's there and it can snatch it, it'll do it. If, you know, a butterfly gets caught in a web, you know, the spider's going to eat it. So there are a lot of these general predators that will capture a honeybee when it's available. That's just part of the cycle. So that's not gonna decimate by any means our honeybee or our native bee population at all. That's just the cycle of life out in the garden. Now, there are some things that do parasitize honeybees. Uh, you know, there's some wasps that will, uh, and in nature, that's okay. There's actually a fly, a bee fly that kind of mimics a honeybee that will drop an egg in some of our ground nesting bees and that developing larva of the bee fly will eat the pollen and then also eat the larva of your, your solitary bee. That's also just kind of part of the cycle. So none of those things is, is going to decimate our native or honey bee populations. You won't see any change. It's just life in the garden. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about some of those. You know, in beekeeping industry, we have other big issues uh, that we try to manage, but in the outdoor garden, if a honeybee or native bee is food, it's something else is surviving. It's like the snake going up the bird feeder. 
things happen in the garden. Uh, okay, Dr. Dale, let's see. I want to, which one do I want to ask you? Let's see. Let's go with, um, say that uh, a city uh, planted, you know, native wildflowers along the right of ways, you know, what benefit would that have to some of our um, native insects? Uh, yeah, so so planting wildflowers is, um, it's become a, a very popular thing to do and it's a great way to, uh, it, it has a lot of benefits. So we've done some work that has shown that if you plant wildflowers in an area, you are boosting pollinator populations. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of a lot of pollinators are also predators and parasites, so you're boosting their populations. And then generally, you're just increasing biodiversity in that area. Um, so a lot of right-of-ways in areas are typically just composed of, of bahia grass or another mowed ground cover. Um, and relative to that, wildflower mixtures support a lot more biodiversity. Um, other benefits of that is you don't have to mow it as frequently. So you're reducing that labor cost and you're reducing the carbon emissions associated with mowing. Um, you don't typically irrigate right away. So you're not reducing irrigation, but areas where you do this, you could reduce irrigation. Um, and one thing we've shown that it isn't as relevant for right of ways, but if this was next to your lawn or something, um, that increase in predator and parasite populations also translates to an increase in natural pest control within like a 60 to 70 foot radius of that flowering habitat. So there's a lot of benefits of doing that. Great. Great. So yeah, hopefully that is something we've seen more cities um, getting interested in doing. So that's good. And our state DOT folks. So uh, Beth, Beth or Mary have some master gardener volunteers that have done a lot with roadside wildflowers. Is that you, Beth, right? That's Mary. That's, 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 that's Mary. Mary. Yeah. Good job, Mary. Santa so Rosa. It, master. It's also really important because there's um, a lot of evidence showing that biodiversity around the globe is declining um, due to various reasons. So anything we can do to help counter that is is important okay julie i got a question for you so you know what types of things we could do and maybe this is similar to maybe some of dr dale's you know, maybe long bullets but you know what can we do as an individual on our property to help sustain an ecosystem to keep these beneficial insects around and keep that diversity high uh, well, definitely planting a variety of plant material, you know, different species, uh, staggering flowering time so that you're kind of always offering some type of benefit to insects as far as your, um, you know, nectar and pollen goes, um, you know, keeping those habitats, places for them to, to land, to hide, to breed, you know, that's all helpful, restricting your, um, your pesticide use. And, and really a big part of that is just having a higher tolerance level too for injury to your plants. Um, you know, we get calls from people in who, it's, it seems it's not only people who transplant here from other areas, but I, I you know, sometimes you, they're, they're just kind of amazed at the amount of damage that can occur to plants in a short period of time. Um, but a lot of our plants, especially native plants, can really tolerate a lot of feeding damage or even some disease issues, you know, flooding, drought. And they might look kind of rough for a little while, but a lot of them are very, very um, adapted to recover from that. And, you know, if you, if you can just change your expectations, that really goes a long way to, to uh, supporting the <laughs> supporting the environment really yeah. plant plant a bunch of diversity and don't freak out if you get some bugs on your plants right exactly exactly <laughs> get, get, give the predators a chance to show up and, yeah. and really it's it can be really entertaining to to see it happen too uh coming from an entomologist of course yes uh one more question on supporting them and this uh for dr dale uh, this has to do with your exterior lights uh, and this is something i've uh, talk to folks about with fireflies, but, you know, with, uh, will dimming the exterior lights, maybe minimizing how much outside lights you have, um, is that going to be helpful? Um, 
to beneficial insects. And the, some of the question is, you know, if we get rid of these lights, is that going to get rid of some of the pest kind of moth species that might be out there as well? So maybe just t tell us your thoughts on outside lighting and what that can do to beneficials and maybe some of the pest insects that might be out there. Yeah, so, so lighting is really important in the insect world. Um, artificial light, there's a, there's a growing amount of research that has focused on the effects of artificial light at night and how that influences insect interactions. Um, a lot of insects uh, have what we call positive phototaxis, so they are attracted to a light. You turn a light on and they're uh, googly-eyed for it and they go fly at it. Um, so just like on your back porch, if you have a back porch light, that's why you have millions of bugs just piled up on your porch. Um, so in general, lights affects insects. Uh, this affects insects differently. So some pests, uh, like a lot of moths, a lot of caterpillar pests, um, mole crickets, uh, spittle bugs, these are all attracted to lights. So if you can turn the lights off at night, that's going to reduce the attraction of the, a lot of those plant pests, uh, particularly turf grass pests, um, to that area. In addition, it's going to just reduce any kind of impact it's having on insects in your landscape. Um, if you think about uh, some insect that just lives in a tree and is used to being in the dark at night, and then you have this spotlight shining on this tree every night. Imagine yourself trying to sleep in your bedroom with a spotlight shining in your bedroom. I've never thought of it like that, but yeah, it's a good point. So the landscape lighting can be really pretty, but all I think about every time I see landscape lighting are those bugs living in the plants that are just blinded every time, every night. Um, but so lights make a big difference. And the inner thoughts of entomologists. Great. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dale. Uh, I need to get Danielle talking some more, Dan. So uh, we're going to move into some of the questions we got on specific insects. And again, folks, if you all have questions, let's see. I think on Zoom, you can type them in the Q&A. You can put them in the chat. And on Facebook, uh, if you're listening on Facebook, you can put them in the comments. And Ashley is going to try to get them over to us so that we can answer those as well. But Let's get into some of these specific questions. And we're going back to leaf-footed bugs, Danielle. Uh, folks wanna know, you know, what do I do about these stinking leaf-footed bugs, either on tomatoes, you know, that's the big one. They get on tomatoes and they, you know, they make those little pock marks sometimes in the fruit. So what can we do about leaf-footed bugs, Danielle? Yeah, good question, Mark. So again, a lot of this is gonna be, you know, sound really repetitive but it, it holds true for pretty much all of the insects that we deal with. Um, you know, a good place to start is when you are seeing them, if you see them, hand picking them. Um, generally in a garden or a landscape setting um, where, you know, you don't have acres and acres of tomatoes, something in a garden is gonna be way more attainable to hand pick and, and get rid of. So um, when you're doing that and, and getting rid of them, you wanna either you know, squish them, or in my case, I like to feed mine to my chickens. <laughs> so um, it, getting rid of them and then you know, making sure that they don't come back. You know, if you just you know, shoo them away, they're still gonna be there, but you know, maybe squishing them or yeah, getting rid of them. Um, and then of course, attracting, you know, beneficial insects. Um, we've heard a lot about that. So diversity, diversity is key, planting um, different species of plants to encourage those. Um, and then Julie mentioned, you know, being tolerant. And I really, really think that is important is being tolerant and understanding, you know, we do live in Florida. We are going to always, always experience insects, no matter what we do. They're never going to, they're never going to be, you know, eradicated or gone forever. Um, so just understanding that, but um, that, that sometimes people, they <laughs> struggle with that. Um, so we like to, you know, go through these motions first. And then of course, using a chemical kind of as a last, you know, 
a last ditch effort to try to control. But um, again, and Mark mentioned, you mentioned, you know, making sure that they are in the correct life stage. So when leaf footed bugs are in their nimble stage, they're going to be much, much easier to control if you are using um, a chemical insecticide. Um, when they are grown and they are adults, they are much difficult to control because they have that hard exoskeleton. Um, so targeting the correct life stage. Um, but again, you know, you want to start with your least toxic methods first. Um, so your insecticidal soaps, maybe your horticultural oils, um, and then move into something that might be a little bit harsher um, so that you are um, keeping those beneficial insects and not targeting um, those as well. You know, when you grab your leaf-footed bugs, Danielle, they're related to stink bugs. So what happens sometimes? You, they stink. They kind of smell. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I like to do, and it goes with, you know, the beak, right? The a Leatherman or like needle nose pliers. I don't know if I mentioned this here before, but I like to grab them with those needle nose pliers and pretend I'm like a little bird or something and just squish them <laughs> with those pliers. Um, okay, let's go to Beth. Let's Beth. Let's ask Beth a question about wasps. Now, Beth, someone wants to know, are wasps really beneficial? Oh my really? goodness. Uh, you know, luckily Dr. Dale started with a good explanation of some of the parasitoid world. Uh, but, you know, we think of wasps kind of in that negative connotation because we've all been stung. And I don't, there's probably someone who thinks that's a pleasant sensation, but the majority of us don't. It's very painful, there's reactions. Uh, and so that's kind of how we think of the wasp group. But overall, wasps are so extremely beneficial in the garden. Uh, we have our predator wasps that are going and getting caterpillars that are getting cicadas and taking those back to help rear their young. We have that other group of amazing wasps that just the diversity is unbelievable called the parasitoids that like Dr. Dale wonderfully described in one of my favorite movies, Aliens, uh, <laughs> that nice vivid picture of what's happening. But these parasitoids really just search out uh, and will lay an egg on a grub, a mole cricket, uh, a, a beetle in a log. It could be a, a white fly larva, it could be an aphid. And so they're gonna lay their egg and that, that young is gonna develop and kill uh, that host. And so those are things that are happening all the time in a garden in the wasp world. What we see are wasps visiting flowers. We see the adults getting that pollen and nectar, being great pollinators, but we don't always see that really important other activity that wasps do. Uh, so if you really want to look at some fascinating creatures, look a little more in depth at some of the parasitoid wasps. And Dr. Dale, you even found one in your office, correct? Today? That's right. Uh, so there are parasitoids that attack cockroaches. So um, it's not necessarily a great thing if you have them flying around your house, but it does mean that uh, you've got something e eating the cockroaches that are there. This wasn't in my house. It was in my office. But <laughs> oh, it's it's fine. It's Florida, Dr. Dale. The roaches <laughs> are just a regular thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, so that's just one example of a wasp doing, you know, helping us out in managing and think of outdoors, think of all the things we don't want. Uh, but these parasitoids are so important. And one of the reason we have diversity that we're really cautious with these blanket insecticide treatments is because we want to maintain that extremely good population of some of these wasps that we may never even see their activity because they're so small or they're hidden. Uh, but just go out. If you have flowers, look on your flowers and you're going to be amazed at the world of wasps that are feeding on those that really they're not out, you know, to give you a sting. They're, they're busy doing their own thing. Uh, so hopefully you won't have that negative experience with a wasp. And if you want to see a great video, go ahead, Danielle. I knew yeah, she was I, you knew it was coming, Mark. I knew it. So there is this really, really dramatic video that National Geographic puts out on parasitic wasps. And I show it at every single like garden talk or gardening program that I teach about insects. And it is really in depth and it's pretty dramatic, but it shows 
parasitic wasps and how they work. And it's really cool. I actually showed it to our 4 H'ers last week and they were like, whoa, they were so amazed. So it's really cool. So I would highly encourage y'all to check that video out. Awesome. Yeah. She, everyone loves that video. It's a little gross, but I love it. It is very dramatic. They it's get the music dramatic. going and everything. Uh, Dr. Dale, real quick, is um, insecticidal soap or dishwashing soap, what did they ask here? Uh, a dish soap solution, is that effective against wasps? Uh, so dish soap solution, I imagine if you sprayed enough of it on a wasp, it would kill it, but you'd probably be chasing it around and wind up with dish, dish soap everywhere. <laughs> uh, so I would say no. Um, in general, dish soap, a dish soap solution is is not something we recommend for using as, as a pesticide um, because it's not a pesticide. It's really a detergent that is used to dissolve oils and grease. Uh, so it's something you gotta be really mindful of, especially if you have, or are using dish soap solutions to control plant pests, because you can cause a lot of damage on your plants because it strips the oils off of the plant leaves and then can cause them to dry out, get sunburned, um, and have other issues. So in general, dish soap solutions are, are not a good choice for pest control or, yeah, I often tell or beneficial folks, control in this case. I often tell folks to just, you know, get that insecticidal soap from the, the hardware store or the garden center because it's gonna, it's, it's formulated just for killing pests, not for cleaning your hands and your dishes type of thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, we had, I know, squash vine bugs. Squash vine bugs came up in some of the, the uh, registration questions, and I believe someone on Facebook just asked, you know, I lost all my squash. They all got this, you know, wormy, larvae-looking thing in the stem. So um, who wants to take, actually, because I, I didn't have anyone down for this question, but who wants to take on squash vine borers and how in the world do I keep them from tearing up my squash patch? Any takers? They always tear up my squash patch also, so I stop planting squash. So. <laughs> That's one way Dr. Dale got around. He's buying squash from the grocery store. <laughs> I'm yeah. not the one to answer this question. A anyone want to take a stab at it? I will try. We don't get Julie or Beth or Danielle to pipe up. I'll try. So, you know, the only things I've heard that work well against squash vine borers are planting early enough, right? So one of the problems is if you plant too late your squash, uh, you know, the warmer it gets, the more pest pressure there is, more insects are around. So planting as early as possible, there's always a risk that you're gonna get a freeze and, you know, you're gonna lose your squash, but that's one way. Uh, insect covers, right? So you can use, uh, you know, as a way of basically deterring them from getting to your squash. You can use these kind of like floating row covers, but you do need to make sure you lift them every now and again so that the pollinators can get in and pollinate your squash. I've heard of foil. Who's heard, how many of y'all have heard of putting foil around the base of the squash plant to keep them from laying eggs? So I've heard that, but then I noticed in my own garden, the squash vine bore adult laying eggs on the leaves. So that, that doesn't always work. Uh, and then I've also heard of trap crops. So kind of planting, a, I think Hubbard squash comes up for squash vine borer, planting another species of squash or variety of squash and hope that all the squash vine borers go over there and leave your, you know, your yellow crookneck squash alone. But uh, I have one that the, a master gardener vol volunteer of mine swears by, but I don't think it's uh, university approved. So maybe I'll ask Dr. Dale afterwards about what he thinks about that, because it is a it's a larvae that can be controlled by BT, but unfortunately it gets into your, you know, the stem and can't get contacted. But um, any other ideas out there? Squash vine borers? And squash vine borers, you'll know you'll have them because you water in the morning and just an hour or two later, all the leaves look like, you know, you haven't watered in weeks. Uh, and then you'll start to see their frass, their poop kind of come out of the stem. But they're a tough one. So uh, there's really, as you can see, it was crickets around here because they're not very easy to control. I, I buy my uh, squash and zucchini at the, at the grocery store. At the grocery store, yeah. Uh, the other good thing, if you plant early, you get enough squash and zucchini that by the time the squash vine borers come along, your family's sick of eating squash and zucchini. So that's another thing to keep in mind. 
Um, let's go to mole crickets. Dr. Dale, you're a bit of a mole cricket expert. So, you know, are mole crickets beneficial? If not, how can I, you know, control them? What do I need to do? Maybe you can see the mole cricket on the wall behind me. <laughs> I know you uh, like mole crickets. I, I love mole crickets. Mole crickets are great. Um, so are mole crickets beneficial? I guess that's a little complicated. Um, I would say the native mole crickets are beneficial. Lots of stuff eats mole crickets. Um, so you find mole crickets in bat poop, in owl poop, um, all sorts of things eat mole crickets. Um, and I think as someone pointed out in the questions, uh, their dog eats mole crickets too, because they dig them up. So that's one reason there's such a problem in a lot of like on golf courses because armadillos, raccoons, birds, they just, they know a mole cricket's in there, they tear up the grass trying to find it. Um, we do have three invasive mole cricket species in Florida and they are also a, a big food source for a lot of things, but they cause more problems probably than they do uh, good things. Um, so lots of stuff eat them, but they also cause a lot of major economic problems and plant damage. Uh, so yeah, I would say they're also very interesting. So in my opinion, they're probably the most interesting turf grass pest we have because they are just, if you look at a mole cricket, they're clearly really crazy looking. So they're really great at engaging kids and people who aren't into insects. Uh, but they're also adapted to dig through the soil like a mole. If you throw it in the middle of a pond, it can easily swim back to the edge because they're very good swimmers. Um, they can fly several miles and they can hop straight up out of a bucket. So they can do a lot of different stuff. And they have these nematodes that attack them. They swim in their body and kill them. They also have parasitoid wasps and flies that attack them. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting things going on and the males, uh, I could talk about this all day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're running out of time, Dr. Dan. <laughs> the males rub their wings together to call for females at night when the sun goes down. So if you're ever in your yard and you hear a cricket in the grass, look in, there's probably a tunnel with a male sitting there calling females in. And so if these things are causing damage, what do we do for control of mole crickets? So I mentioned lights earlier, turning off your lights is one really good way because they're very attracted to lights at night. Um, so if you don't have lights on, they're not gonna be flying in. They also really like wet soil. So uh, reducing irrigation can make a big difference um, or prioritizing any kind of pest control measures to the low lying areas or wet soil areas. Um, that can also be very effective. Uh, Let's see. Those are the cultural practices you can do. And then there are several insecticides that are effective at controlling them, but timing makes a big difference. So if you think about how big a mole cricket is, um, they're not quite as big as the one on the wall behind me, but the adults are like two inches long. Insecticides have a hard time controlling those. So you've got to control the ones that are recently hatched and that's going to depend on the time of year. So timing makes a very big difference. Okay. Thank you, mole cricket expert. We'll have to, we'll have to do a session just on mole crickets for Dr. Dale to come back. Yeah. Uh, they sounded, you know, until you talked about the nematodes invading, they sounded like superheroes. You know, they can jump, they can swim, they can fly. Um, I'm going to as, let's see, Beth. Beth, I'm coming to you to talk about mantids. So uh, first of all, let's just settle this one, Beth. Which is better as a predator insect, praying mantis or lady beetle? It's the battle of the bugs right here on Gardening the Panhandle Live. Okay. Uh, well, they're two different kind of predators. So your, your praying mantid is going to be a kind of what we call a generalist feeder. Uh, it's going to eat whatever it catches, and they do it exceptionally well. They're very camouflaged, so you don't always see them in the landscape. Uh, they've got some very powerful legs uh, with nice spines on them for grabbing and, and catching whatever comes by. Uh, the lady beetle on the underhand is even though, you know, it's 
kind of general. It's going to hone in on more of your soft-bodied insects. So some of your landscape pests like scale, aphids, white fly that tend to cause you problems, the ladybug's really going to go after those things. So if you're looking at it from that perspective, uh, the ladybug's probably going to win out in helping keep your landscape pest problems managed, whereas the praying mantis, you know, it'll just grab anything. Uh, so even though beneficial, uh, not necessarily quite as specific. So it sounds like you're leaning to the lady beetles, Beth. Yeah, we'll go She's for the lady She's calling it. Uh, now, and then we had someone else ask, you know, they moved from Alabama to the Panhandle recently, and they haven't seen very many praying mantids. Are, are they rare in our area? Are they, you know, what's the deal with their abundance, I guess, in the Panhandle? No, they're not rare at all. Uh, Julie has a wonderful uh, praying mantid she keeps. They're great pets. Uh, just but remember, they're very camouflaged, uh, so they they do stay hidden. You know, with the, the shape of their body and their coloration, uh, it's likely if you really did a good evaluation of your landscape and had kind of a a cloth and a, a stick over a tree and was were hitting foliage, you would have one drop out. Uh, or sometimes, if you go out at the right time on your screen porch, you'll see one sitting there. But I, it's not that they're rare; they're very common in Florida just great at camouflage. So another tip to go observe, like go outside, drink your coffee and just look around and observe and see what you're, what you're finding out there. And now Julie, how long has your praying mantis, how long do they live? You have that as a pet, really? Um, well, I, this one I've had for a couple of weeks. Um, I haven't really had it. Maybe a, I don't know if it's been quite a month. Um, and I don't know how long it'll live. And and insects pet, usually have I guess as, as long as I can keep finding something to feed it. So <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, you know, we have pet plants, you know, we have plants in our house, but you know, they got bugs because yeah, Julie. Um, all right, some other miscellaneous. Let's see, here's some miscellaneous uh insects. And we got about five minutes left. Actually, before I ask some of these miscellaneous questions, since we only got five minutes left, want to let everyone know, uh, you know. We will be having another one of these. Is it August 12th, I believe? August 12th, there's going to be another Gardening the Panhandle Live. Uh, it's going to be an open Q&A. So there is no off limits as long as it's related to gardening and horticulture, right, y'all? Um, and I did want to ask the panelists, do you have a favorite predator insect or parasitoid? We'll go with parasitoid. Uh, we'll start with Beth. What you got, Beth? Uh, my favorite is the uh, minute pirate bug. Uh, I, I, it's black and white. I actually named my cat Ori after its uh, name, Orius insidiosus. Wow. That was going to be my choice too, Beth, but I'll say um, Tamarixia radiata, which is the parasitoid for the Asian citrus psyllid. Would probably mm -hmm. be my second favorite. Not, thr well, never mind. Yeah, thrips aren't predators. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah. Well, the minute pirate bug is like the major predator of thrips. So that's why they're. Uh, yeah. Danielle's a thrips lover. That's why it is. Uh, Julie, what about you? Sorry about that. Well, I, I'm, I've kind of, I like the predators. So I'm kind of on the fence between the mantids and dragonflies. I really, I really like dragonflies a lot. And we have a lot of, around our property that, um, are fun to, to watch and, and try to photograph. I can't catch them though. I'm not fast. They're enough. so hard. Yeah. They, <laughs> They're they, they really those, fast. <laughs> they got those beautiful colors too, like the pinks and the purple sometimes, right? Yeah. yeah but don't ask me to identify them because I, <laughs> I'm not counting wing space. Uh -huh. uh, a a buddy I used to work with, he was the, he was an right. expert at uh, identifying the larvae, I guess. So if you got, if you get the larvae, I can send them to Johnny. He'll, he'll ID them for us. Uh, and Dr. Dale, what about you? Your favorite predator or parasitoid? That's a really tough question. Uh, but I would say my favorite predator are green lacewing larvae. Um, that's what kind of got me interested in entomology. These things have these two sickle like mouth parts. Imagine these little tiny elephant tusks that they stab into the sides of their prey and then they pump their prey full of enzymes and then they suck them out like a straw. So, wow. It's pretty incredible to watch under a microscope. So they do that to aphids and spider mites and all these other pests. Hmm. 
Very cool. Uh, we have a couple more questions that we'll try to get answered. We've got a couple more minutes. And oh, uh, let's see, in the Zoom chat, and I don't know how we're doing this on Facebook, but we got a link to a Qualtrics survey. So please, if you have the time, fill out our survey. Let us know how we're doing. Uh, we love to hear from you, and we love to report on these things to all of our higher ups on how much you're learning and how we're saving the world. So please uh, answer the survey for us. That'd be great. Okay, a couple other questions here. Oh, Danielle, any beneficial insects to help keep down the mosquitoes? So of course, you know, mosquitoes, I always, when I talk about beneficial insects, people are like, no, and insects aren't beneficial because mosquitoes, and they always hate mosquitoes. But when you think about the circle of life, there are so many different things that rely on mosquitoes and eat mosquitoes. But in terms of insects that eat mosquitoes, um, dragonfly larvae, so they're known as mosquito hawks. So um, mosquito larvae are aquatic, and so they um, complete their life cycle in, in standing water, and then there's some, um, for the most part, standing water, a lot of the species we have here in Florida. So um, the the um, dragonfly larvae are also aquatic, and so they eat the mosquito larvae. Um, so I would say the, the, the mosquito hawk or dragonflies. So be nice to your dragonflies. Yeah, but the biggest thing too with uh, mosquitoes, since a lot of them do um, complete their life cycle in standing water, to if you can when you are around um, in the landscape, in your yard, anywhere you see standing water, dump it out. That that can help tremendously cut down um, populations. Um, and here, specifically in Jefferson County, we actually had um, several horses test positive for eastern equine encephalitis. So that, um, although you know the disease incidence in humans is relatively low, that can still um, be spread to humans through mosquitoes. Um, the fact that we had horses that are testing positive, you know, they can still spread it. So just beware, you know, um, mosquitoes do transmit um, viruses to humans. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Um, Beth, we got a question about swallowtail butterflies laying eggs on the parsley. And then of course those caterpillars, once they hatch, right, they eat up all the parsley. Uh, is there a way to stop that? Do we wanna stop it? What should we do? To, if we wanna eat parsley, but we also like seeing swallowtails, how do we, how, how do we balance that? Yeah, most people will grow parsley as a host in addition to using some in the kitchen. Uh, one of the keys is to plant more parsley so that you can spread it around. If you have caterpillars on one, you can move it to another where they can finish that life cycle uh, to become the butterfly. Another option, if you only have a small area with one parsley, you know, put a screen over it during the day when those butterflies would be coming and laying eggs. That plant kind of fabric screen will allow the light to get through. Probably be good for parsley in our summer heat, give it a little break but that can help prevent the egg laying on the leaves. So those would really kind of be your options. Great, thanks Beth. Um, let's see, 201, we got a couple extra questions here. Let me go to Julie now. This one's a little bit tricky because the question is, what are the little insects that hop out of the centipede grass and are they beneficial? So uh, what you got on that, Julie? Well, it could be several different things. What I'm suspecting it is, because we've seen a lot of it this year, is probably the two-line spittle bug, which um, is a little black insect that has little red stripes on it. And a lot of times when you walk through the grass, they'll jump up on your legs. I mean, they don't bite you or do anything, but that's been really, really common this year. Um, and they're sap feeders, so they you know, can cause damage to the turf. I wouldn't necessarily classify them as beneficial. Most of the time we don't have to do anything to control them, but I know this year we had a really heavy population. Um, and so it may warrant control if the, if the grass is not able to sustain the damage. Um, but that's probably what they were talking about, but without a photo, I'm really not sure. So that was yeah. my guess. Yeah, best thing, you know, there's a lot of insects. So the best thing to do is, you know, try to get a picture, try to collect a sample, 
put it in a little Ziploc baggie or a Tupperware or something and, and bring it to your local agent. And, you know, especially if you're in, you know, Pensacola, Panama City, Monticello, these folks are going to love getting insect samples dropped off at the office. Um, well, I think we have reached, oh, oh, let's see, we had questions, here we go. We had questions that came through about citrus leaf miners. So who wants to address uh, citrus leaf miner, maybe control, maybe are there beneficials that help control it? But you know, the, the, the person wrote that they've been using neem and an insecticidal soap in an attempt to control leaf miner on their citrus. Uh, what do you what do you folks want to Danielle you want to attack that yeah I can talk to that a little bit so with leaf miners it is a very very teeny tiny moth that will lay her eggs in the leaves of usually the young tender um, new growth on citrus and then the immatures will hatch out and the larvae will mine a lot of the times when people find the mines the um, larvae has already pupated and hatched and is actually not present there in the mine. Um, so you would not be, if you were doing an application, you wouldn't be controlling anything because there's not necessarily anything there to control. Um, so a lot of times I'll get samples brought in to me that they're they're just old um, mines and they look kind of grungy and and dirty um so there's really not a lot there um and then again it kind of goes back to the cosmetic um and the tolerable leaf miners really aren't unless you have young tree young young trees aren't usually a major major pest um in citrus they don't transmit any um diseases or anything like that they just are pretty much cosmetic. Um, there is an insect, um, a systemic insecticide that can be used, but um, the issue with that is timing. Um, you would have to time the application. So uh, two weeks prior to before the tree is flushing so that the tree can take it up. And then when the leaf miners are actually feeding. Um, so it gets a little bit tricky there. Um, but really, it's just cosmetic a lot of the times, unless, you know, the tree is really, really young and, you know, every single leaf on the tree has a, a leaf miner. That can be a problem. But, um, yeah. Thank you, Danielle. I found your own article that you wrote a couple months ago, and I posted that in the chat for everyone. So check okay. it out, everyone. Uh, okay, folks. Well, it's well, it's two o five here, but one o five in Central Time. Uh, do we? If we have any more questions from the group, I think we've answered all the questions here. I think we've answered all the registration questions. I think we're good. Uh, I want to thank everyone in Facebook Land and Zoom Land for joining us, and I especially want to thank our awesome panelists. So thank you, Julie, Beth, Danielle, and Adam. And I don't want to forget the our other folks helping us out in the background, Ashley. Kush over in Jackson County, Mary Derrick in Santa Rosa, and John Wells. Appreciate it. Uh, have a great rest of your week, everyone. And again, we'll be having another one of these August 12th. So be on the lookout for that. And if you subscribe to Guardian in the Panhandle, the uh, blog, uh, I think you'll be getting a follow up here soon with a lot of these resources. Uh, and so look out for that on our website and on that blog that you receive. So again, thanks. Uh, panelists and thank you folks for joining us everyone have a great day thank you mark no problem appreciate you piece of cake bye y'all bye bye